Thanks, brother. Full, full disclosure, we do not take potatoes. <laughs> and we'll, we'll find who it was and we'll send it back with you. That's uh, uh, not how we're going to be checking those bags afterwards. Uh, uh, please open up with me to the book of Luke. We're going to be in chapter 22 tonight. If you're new uh, or visiting or you've uh, not been in quite a long while, our practice at the moment, our current series at nighttime is to be going through the New Testament and looking, well, really all of Scripture and looking at those uh, hints, those statements, those theological explanations of what it is that the blood of Jesus Christ does for us. What does the blood of Christ accomplish for us? What are the benefits in the blood of Jesus, which are given to us in this relationship with God that we enter by faith. And one of the key languages or studies that we're going to be doing tonight is really around that language, the new covenant. Because that is what Jesus talks about in Luke chapter 22. And really all of the benefits that we've been looking at so far. Here's how I want you to think. If you've ever wondered, how exactly can I, can I detail, can I explain, or how can I define what the new covenant is? It's basically this, that all the benefits we've been looking at about that the blood of Jesus does to us, it washes us, it buys us, it frees us, it saves us, it brings us near to God, it gets us adoption, it justifies us, it equips us, it sanctifies us. You don't have to memorize it. Let's try that again. Uh, all of the benefits that Jesus' blood does for us, if you wrap them all up into one package, and, and, and understand that we receive it by faith. That is the new covenant. The benefits of Jesus' blood given to us by faith alone, regardless of background, regardless of religious, uh, former religious uh, background or experience, that's the new covenant. That all people and any people are welcomed to full relationship with God now and into eternity because of what Jesus did for us on the cross where he gave up his life, he bled for us, and therefore and thereby sealed and ratified the new covenant. That's, that's in simple terms. So tonight, we'll be looking at Luke chapter 22, and to really set the scene, we have to understand how, how holy of a night this really was in the life of Jesus. This is when Jesus goes to uh, celebrate probably about the 30th of his life, maybe about the, the 25th that he would ever remember, the annual Jewish holiday or celebration of Passover. And it's at this point that he's really going to uh, enjoy or partake in the third Passover since he's become the public itinerant preacher. And this is probably the third Passover that he's taken with the gentlemen of his friendship group that are now his disciples or what he will even sometimes call the apostles, the sent ones who have his authority to teach what he teaches. So he's about to sit down and have this Passover annual celebration with the disciples who have been following and learning from him. And we will see, we'll look at the, uh, the, the, the exact quote that uh, we're really diving into tonight, which is in uh, verse 20. But we're going to go from verse 19 down to verse 20. The book of Luke tells us this. And he took bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it and gave it to them, saying... This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, uh, he took uh, the cup after they had eaten and said, this cup is poured out for you, it, and, and it is the new covenant in my blood. May God bless this. I know maybe mysterious, maybe over familiar because you've read it so many times as we take communion. I don't know where you stand, but may God bless this word in our midst to our salvation and sanctification this evening. Amen. Amen. Jesus is partaking in this ceremony of the Passover, and we're going to go through the liturgy in just a moment of how the Jews actually celebrated it, but this is the mind-blowing action that he takes in the middle of the ceremony. He stands up and says, listen, I'm changing things. I'm redoing the liturgy. I'm, I'm reorganizing what things symbolize and what they signify. Here's a cheat code. It's all about me. Everything's about me. In fact, by even changing the order of, of, of the whole night, by getting in the way of the liturgy and saying, I'm making new rules and it's about me, he's also declaring to be on par with Yahweh, the God who first gave these commandments through Moses. Moses. 
So Jesus is, in other words, by interrupting the meeting that he was leading, he was sort of the, he was the leader of his group, and they were all having a ceremonial dinner together, and in the middle of it, he stops it, edits it, makes it about him, and really claims, I'm the God who gave this in the first place. That means that I want you to keep on doing it, and doing it in worship of me. Remembrance of me. What an amazing shock. Now, we read this, and it's not immediately shocking to us. I have to try and explain and amp up for you and and make clear how shocking it would have been, but I, I won't be able to do it justice. But if you were there on that night of the final Passover, of the first Christian communion table, if you were there and you had been raised Jewish and you'd heard all of the uncouth, out-of-pocket, swinging wild things that this Jesus rabbi, Messiah of yours, kept on saying that was going to get him killed eventually, in fact, just 12 hours from now, and you heard him say this, again, if you were Peter or any one of the other disciples, you'd, you'd cringe a bit. Oh, did the authorities hear him say that? I hope, I hope nobody goes and tells anybody that he just did that to the Passover. That's, that's blasphemy if he's not Yahweh. And it's blasphemy if he's not really fulfilling the Passover. So this is a, an integral study. As we study his blood, this is Jesus' own words incarnate with his blood flowing through his veins, his own words incarnate speaking about his blood and what it will achieve. So this is a holy, holy portion of scripture to then study about Jesus' blood. So here's the seven-part liturgy, uh, and liturgy just means like the order of service that they would have done as Jews in the Passovers. First of all, uh, they would have a prepared table. They all come in and sit down. We know that Luke chapter 22 tells us Jesus did this. Um, He sort of had, uh, because the coppers were out to get him, and the Jewish leaders, the uh, religious leaders were out to get him, he had sort of organized a bit of a wink, nudge, secret handshake, draw with your toe, uh, a secret room that somebody was going to organize for him and his disciples out of the sight of other people. So he sends two of his disciples into town, and the deal was the guy standing there holding water, usually usually not a homeowner's job, usually a slave's job, usually a woman's job. So so you'll see him. He's going to be standing there holding a pitcher of water, looking out, and when when the two Jewish, Jewish spies for Jesus come into town, they nod, they come over to the hymn and say the secret words, The master has need of a room. Ah, he said the secret words. Then he showed them up to the upper room. They made provisions and preparations. And then Jesus and his disciples went and had a seat. It changes the whole vibe of when you realize that it's it's undercover, this worship service. The first underground church meeting was Jesus with the disciples. So they go in there. And the way they would start, having sit around their table on the ground, all sort of leaning over. They would have the the food all on the front of them. And the leader of the service, or the leader of the house, Jesus, in this case, he would open in a prayer. We don't know exactly what he said. We don't know exactly, it's not accounted for us precisely how he prayed. But you would open in a prayer. Then, now they have four glasses of wine throughout this meal. Amen, somebody. They weren't Baptists, apparently. Uh, but if, they, they, these, these were, this was more watered-down wine than what we're used to. And again, the, the meal would take a couple of hours, so, so they weren't gushing down wine. They were drinking responsibly. But nonetheless, they would have four wines throughout the night. First of all, you would pray and open. Secondly, the first cup of wine would be enjoyed, and they would also have some dipping sauce that they would enjoy with it, which all sort of symbolized different areas of the Passover occurrence. Thirdly, after the first cup of wine, or while people are enjoying the first cup of wine, the host would rehearse the Passover story from Exodus 12 and following. I would have, wouldn't you love to be a fly on the wall as God incarnate retells the story from the destroying angel's point of view, from Yahweh's point of view, from God's point of view. Jesus was telling them how he saw Passover happen. And he was explaining the story, and, and uh, maybe by, by having God's mind, he was adding some details that you didn't see in Exodus chapter 12. We don't know. But Jesus told to them the story of the first Passover when Moses led the people out of Egypt. And following that, they would sing Psalm 113. They would sing as a hymn together as brothers. Yes, men sing. The fourth part is that they would then have a second cup of wine, and he would say grace. He would pray a blessing over the food that they're about to eat. Then they would eat the meal, which would have roasted lamb, unleavened bread, that is bread basically without yeast, that didn't rise. It's kind of dry cracker bread or flat bread. 
And then they would also have bitter herbs along with it to remember the bitterness of their enslave, enslavement. All of this would mean something. The, after the supper meal that they enjoyed together, the leader would stand up and offer a prayer. Maybe it was shared among multiple people, but at least the leader would offer a prayer of thanksgiving, of blessing, of worship to God. And then they would have the third cup of wine. And then they would sing Psalm 114 through Psalm 118. They would sing those psalms together in worship to God, and then they would have their final and fourth cup of wine together, and that would uh, finalize and conclude the celebration of the Passover ceremony. There are some even modern, though they are very ancient, but still modern Jewish practices that modern Jews who, who try and celebrate Passover, the uh, little clue, it's not Passover, there's no such thing as pastor anymore. It was fulfilled and, and, and completely uh, uh, accomplished, but they, call, they celebrate what they call Passover. And what they do now is very similar to what they did in ancient times. Maybe they did it in Jesus' times, but it's evident from Luke chapter 22 and other verses that Jesus didn't partake in this. But what uh, modern Jews do is they do a lot of other traditions like hiding a piece of bread under a napkin and giving uh, striped and pierced bread to children in the room. And they uh, do all sorts of other elements, which still we can look back and see how they even pointed to Jesus. But though, if you're familiar with all of that, uh, some churches will do Passover evenings where they, where they practice those things. Those are not inspired. Those are not divinely given. This is the liturgy that Jesus himself partook in, however. The opening prayer, the wine and sauce, then the Passover story in Psalm 113, a second cup of wine and grace, then a good meal around lamb, roasted lamb, a prayer and a third cup of wine, and then more singing and a fourth cup of wine. This is the liturgy that we see Jesus partaken with his disciples. It's also during this meal that Jesus institutes communion, that is during the supper portion while they're eating the meat, and they're eating the bread, and they are eating the herbs. That's when he does the, this bread is broken for you. This is my body. That's when he does that. After supper, when the third cup of wine, when they pray and then take the cup, that's when Jesus says, this is my blood. This is my, the wine that represents the new covenant. And it is um, uh, uh, in Psalm 114 to Psalm 118, when they sing that, that's what Matthew 26 verse 30 refers to when it says, at the end of all of this, they sung a hymn together and then they got up and went to the Mount of Olives. That's where Jesus would then pray before being arrested. So all of this comes together in the, in the Gospels to show us a rich night of worship together and somewhere in there, Judas scurries out of the room, goes and finds the uh, chief priests and the servant slaves and leads them to Jesus up at Mount uh, olives up in the garden of Gethsemane. This is a very important night. So let's, let's look at just the very things that Jesus is teaching us. As we think of the Passover, or on that night of Jesus, uh, uh, of Luke chapter 22, we should think of it as the last Passover. Sometimes this is called the last supper from that very famous painting. The last Passover and the first communion supper. As we think about it, we're going to look at what Jesus says about himself in and through the practice of the Passover and what he communicates to us in Luke chapter 22. And maybe we'll look at some of the other uh, gospel verses as well, Matthew, Mark, and John. So first of all, Jesus would have opened with a prayer. Then they would have had, a, uh, had the wine and sauce, and Jesus would have, uh, uh, having prayed, uh, verse 15 in Luke chapter 22 says that Jesus tells them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I, um, I will not eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. So Jesus is here saying to them, I have so desired, I have so earnestly waited, I've so zealously anticipated this night with you so that I can partake in this before I suffer. Now, isn't it amazing that Jesus, knowing the will of God, is able to eagerly anticipate something that would point so closely to his suffering, such as his love. His, his suffering would not deter him from his anticipation of establishing, hear this, the kingdom of God. This is the twofold reason why Jesus so eagerly anticipated this meal that he is first sharing, this is the first cup that he is telling them this. I eagerly anticipated this, that I should share it with you, and I'm not going to do this meal again. I'm not going to have another cup of wine 
outside of this context, until the kingdom of God is established. Some people think that means he's fasting wine until he comes back again. But we see in the uh, post-resurrection appearances that it's, he seems to have meals with them. He seems, in fact, to, constant, uh, uh, to institute and have again with them a Lord's Supper. It doesn't seem that that's at all what he's saying. No, Jesus is saying, this is immediately before my suffering. This is immediately before I bring the kingdom of God in by his death. His two reasons Jesus was so eager to have this meal with them. First of all, because of what it ended. And second of all, because of what it anticipated. In having a communion, uh, sorry, uh, the first communion and the last Passover with his disciples, he understands that this is representing and truly fulfilling and though ending all future Passover gathering. This is the last Passover, maybe not on certain people's calendars. This is the last Passover on God's calendar. This is the last, it's very likely that the early Christians who were Jews, they kept on taking this year by year, but they would come to realize that this was no longer a divinely instituted commandment. They would come to realize that it was fulfilled and the Christians stopped partaking in it. This is the final uh, Passover that has any legitimacy before God because the whole purpose of Passover was anticipating and looking forward from the Passover of Egypt to the salvation that God would bring in and through the final Passover lamb. Once that Passover lamb in Jesus, Paul says, 1 Corinthians 5, 7, our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. Once he has been given, once he has been sacrificed, once Jesus comes and in a few hours will die and right now takes the Passover with them, he's saying, I've brought to fulfillment. I am the focus and the object of all prior Passovers and in me they find completion. He is anticipating as, as only God in flesh could, as he was anticipating this meal, he was having both the divine and human Parts of the relationship. I mean, for millennia, if, if we can say that God is partaking in time, and he does, although he is beyond time, but, but God the Son is here saying, I've been worshipped by my people for 1,500 years since the Exodus, this way. And it is so glorious a story, this Passover story, yet it is so incomplete. And so many of the people that worship me do it like Judas, without true faith, and without realizing what they're pointing to. And so many of the people who worship me through this Passover are doing it illegitimately, without faith, and then they go to hell. But now I get to come and fulfill the Passover. I get to lead my people to true, full, clear, explicit worship that is no longer in shadows and, and foggy, vague uh, 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 prophecies and, and shadows, now they get to worship me clearly, with clarity, explicitly. This is what Colossians calls the shadow versus the substance. We could call this the projection versus the reality. Have you ever seen some of these uh, uh, new and modern high-tech sort of uh, developing or building firms that before they are finished building their, their, their huge uh, edifices or their cathedrals or uh, their, their sky rises, sometimes what they'll do is utilize modern technology and use projections up into the sky to show people at nighttime what the finished product is going to look like. And that's pretty cool. I've seen that one time. They actually used drones to uh, high, uh, float lights in the sky and sort of show us what the finished bridge was going to look like. And that was pretty cool. But of course, that's just like the Old Testament, which showed a projection, but not a reality. The new covenant in Jesus, the final Passover and the first communion in Jesus' blood, is like the building actually being finished, and you being able to actually walk into it, actually walk across the bridge, actually enter the edifice. That's the comparison. The shadow and the substance. It is the it is the sentimental fool who will sit there and say, I, I, preferred, the, I preferred the drones, actually. Can, can you bring back the light show? Where'd the light show go? Well, well, it's complete. The light show were just to bide your time so you didn't think the, biz, the building business was doing nothing. It was going somewhere. But now the there is here. We're in it. This is Christ compared to the Old Testament. And therefore, in taking communion, why Jesus was so anticipating this final Passover meal was because he was bringing to completion the incomplete Old Testament ceremonial laws of worship 
and he was starting a new way and a new mode, if you want the technical language, new sacraments for worship. Jesus here, as the Lord who once prescribed worship according to the Mosaic law, is now among his people re-prescribing new ways of worshiping him. He is the Lord, God, Yahweh, the one who spoke to Moses, once told Moses to tell Israel to worship that way. Now he's in flesh worshiping that way as a human, telling them, but I'm also God changing how I want to be worshiped from here on in. The Passover, symbolically along with all of the ceremonial worship that God gave Moses, was finding in here its glorious, amazing fullness and completion. Jesus was abrogating any further. He was not saying the worship of God has been illegitimate. He is simply looking forward and saying, now it's complete. All worship should be done in spirit and truth through me, not through the old ways. He so brought to an end the mosaic manner of incomplete, ignorant worship and rather brought into new method. He initiated through his death for sin, he initiated a full, uh, sorry, a new kind of sacrament and way of worshiping God. That, that's why we do the Lord's Supper. This is how he taught us to do it and not the Passover meal. Thirdly, when Jesus opened up and would have started to explain, the, let's look at this, how he would have explained the history or the story of Passover. Uh, I haven't explained yet. Uh, I know a few week, weeks ago, we looked at how Jesus fulfills the Passover. Maybe you weren't here, so we need to just rehash that to make sure we're all across what the Passover really is historically. But Jesus would have then, after telling them how, how, how zealously he anticipated this meal, because I'm putting to an end all that was part, and I'm bringing into practice what is full and clear and explicit about me, he then would have rehashed and told to them and summarized the, the Passover story. He would have said something along the lines of, we remember here in this meal that God poured out his wrath against the gods of Egypt and their worshipers. He did this by killing the eldest son in every household and the eldest animal in every flock and herd. He made a way, however, of salvation whereby the Israelites could be spared. We remember in this meal that for those who followed the commands of Moses, for those who killed an unblemished lamb, who shed its blood upon their doorposts, who cooked it over the fire, and then who ate it as a family, they were spared from the destroying angel of God. And then at the judgment, as the destroying angel killed many sons, Israel and all who wished to go with them in repentance, Israel departed in haste out of Egypt. They did not even have time for their bread to rise, and that is why we eat tonight unleavened bread. Thus, God saved the host of Israel from the tyranny of Egypt and spared them from the wrath of judgment. I know Jesus would have done an infinitely better, poetic, glorious summary, but that's the idea. That's the story of Passover, which he would have rehearsed in the presence of his disciples. What is amazing is that what was the peak climactic act of redemption in the Old Testament, Jesus is now using as a footstool to reach the ultimate point. It's like if you, as humans we discovered that there was a mountain somewhere on earth uh, north of Nepal, uh, south of China, in what used to be known as the Himalayas, but we've renamed them. They're now called the foothills. Because after a certain earthquake, there has been developed and produced such an enormous mountain that we now call Everest our base camp. We now call the peak of Everest base camp for those who want to hike up the real tallest mountain now in all of the world. Imagine if that was to happen. If you can comprehend that, you're starting to get a taste of what the Jewish men in the room with Jesus then would have heard him saying when he summarized the most climactic, amazing, miraculous act of redemption in the Old Testament and then said, anyway, here's how it really all points to me. There's more. There's greater than that. There's something worth remembering more than 1,500 years every single year all together, the whole nation in one city. There's something more glorious than that. And Jesus is teaching them, you bet he is here and here is what it looks like. And then he explains 
the new covenant, although he doesn't explain it. He introduces it, the apostles write later and explain it. Nonetheless, at that point, Jesus would have shared with them in the second cup of wine. He would have said grace and blessed them, and then they would have gone into their supper. He would have, he would have pointed to the, to the lamb that was dead and reminded them, the lamb died that the Israelites might not be punished. And so it is in the lamb of God who has been sent to take away the sins of the world. He would have shown them the bitter herbs, reminding them of the bitterness of slavery to Egypt. He would have reminded them that even more bitter than that is the enslavement that sin affects and infects upon every human soul. As they had the unleavened bread, which reminded them that they left in haste out of Egypt and God saved them quickly. He actually utilizes the unleavened bread and Paul does this in later passages of the New Testament as well and shown them actually the unleavened bread is a picture that there is no sin in the bread of life which is given from God, the Son of God. Leaven and yeast was a picture of sin. It infects, it grows, and, and then it multiplies, and so it puffs up the bread. And Jesus' picture, as the Old Testament alluded to, was the unleavened bread was a picture of purity. It was a picture of sinlessness. It was a picture of not being infected with yeast. And so Jesus would have pointed to himself, as he does very shortly, when he points to the bread and says, this bread is my body. I am the sinless one. Jesus, during that meal and with the cup of wine that came afterwards, this is when he actually instituted the new pattern for worship and the remembrance of salvation that we call the Lord's Supper or the new covenant meal or the communion. The deliverance of souls from sin, in other words, in Jesus' mindset, but by changing everything from Passover to Lord's Supper, he shows us that the deliverance of souls from sin, Satan, and hell through the blood of his own death was such a more glorious redemption that it now, that it now entirely eclipses the old covenant redemption. It eclipses it. He's just, he's just replacing old ways of worship with new because the old pointed to Jesus in vagueness, the new point to Jesus explicitly. And he would much rather us worship with a full knowledge and mind of what he has done on the cross. So the Old Testament exodus is only for us now a memory pointing to the truer and greater celebration, which is the Lord's Supper. It's often the case that for Christians, most, the most frequent time that you're thinking about the Passover is really only on the way to take communion. We're remembering the Passover only because it points to Jesus. But well, that's not how it worked in the Old Testament. You studied the Passover to remember the Passover because the Passover was God's redemption. And now we have this, I, I just don't think many Christians have quite grappled, quite come to grip with the immense change of, of economy that happened in Jesus' last Passover, first Lord's Supper, which is that now the old covenant salvation, the old, the old exodus, the Old Testament exodus, you only really... You're misthinking of it now if you only think of it. You're misremembering it now if you only remember the story of Israel out of Egypt. The only right way to now consider the Exodus is as a reflection of and a pointer to the redemption from sin, hell, and Satan. That's how Jesus wants us to think about this supper and about the Exodus. So Jesus says these two things. Look at Luke chapter 22 in verse 19. He took the bread. <coughs> he took the bread. That is the bread of the meal that they've been sharing in, the unleavened bread. He took that bread and, he, uh, and after he had said grace or given thanks, he broke it and then gave it to them. Right? He broke it. So he's giving them broken bread, broken unleavened bread. And he said to them, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So he's hereby showing that his body is symbolized in the bread, which is given in sacrifice for people. Let's remember, uh, 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 or ask the question, as I, as I study this, th this, this stood out to me. I mean, it's always dangerous to say this, but you'll mind me just for a rhetorical point. If I were Jesus, <laughs> if I were Jesus, I'd, I'd do a less better job, hence, me not Jesus. But, but I think you might, you might at least identify with me a little bit in saying, if I were Jesus, Maybe if I were Peter, that makes more sense. If I was loudmouth Peter, I would have said, Jesus, if something here on the table is going to represent your body, 
your flesh, since you're the lamb, Jesus, is there one of the other two things on the table that you might want to choose is to represent your body? Your first, your first count doesn't count. I'll, I'll give you three chances. Which one would you like to pick, Jesus? I want the bread. The bread represents... No, wrong, Jesus. The, the meat, Jesus. The lamb. Shouldn't the lamb represent the lamb? Shouldn't meat represent flesh? Shouldn't the body represent body? Doesn't it seem like Jesus kind of got this wrong? You wouldn't say so. I know. But I'm tempted to, to think... So at least it, it struck me and it forced me to ask the question, why, why the bread and not the meat? Because if he had commanded us that the meat was to represent him, the only way that you can get meat out onto a table to be eaten is by first shedding the blood out of it. Which means that he would have, or I would have, the, the stupid Tom, I would have thought to invent a way of telling everybody all of the blood sacrifices are over by then telling them to go and make a blood sacrifice. You wouldn't have been able to partake in lamb meat at communion unless we had a bowl sitting in the kitchen somewhere. Do not serve, not wine, literal blood. We would have to bleed something to then remember that nothing else needs to die. So this is even another, another mercy for the queasy. And this is why vegans can technically be in the church. I hope not, but you, you can to because we're not actually eating meat at the table, because that again would require death. And, and the whole point that Jesus was trying to preach through the Lord's Supper was that nothing has to die anymore. But that's why, don't ask that silly question again, okay? That's why God mercifully says, I'll choose bread this time, so that no more life has to be snuffed out. See, if he told us, eat bread to remember me and make sure you bleed it, then he would have been through the communion. Every single subsequent communion in all of history would have been unpreaching the sermon that communion is supposed to preach, which is that we don't need blood sacrifices. Nothing needs to die. Jesus gave his life, gave his body to be broken for you. That's what he says about the bread. My body is the bread given for you, already broken. Just receive it and benefit by it. So he says that of the bread. He then also picks up the wine. This is verse 20. And likewise, the cup after they had eaten, that's the third wine of the meal, after the supper and after they'd eaten, and he said, this cup is poured out for you and it is the new covenant in my blood. Other versions, for example, Matthew's uh, uh, version will tell us that Jesus says, poured out for the forgiveness of sins, is what Jesus says about the cup itself. He's not obviously being overly literal since he doesn't even say the wine, does he? I've had some Catholics that go, he says, it is his blood. I don't know if you know this, but Catholics genuinely, or true, real Catholics who obey their books, they do believe, if you're a Catholic here tonight, we love you, we're glad you're here, this is what your church believes, and you're not a Catholic if you disagree with the church, so trouble on you, become a Protestant, it, the gospel, you go to heaven, it's great. In the sacrifice of the, well, in the celebration of what they call, they don't call communion, they call the Eucharist, the Mass, they believe that, you can't see it, but underneath reality, the bread literally becomes Jesus' body. It has to. And the wine literally, you can't see it, but literally becomes the hemoglobin blood of the God-man. Now, the first question is one of logic and space. Because if Jesus is in heaven and a thousand churches are taking communion, how many bits of him are gone in heaven? Is he like a puzzle piece that is missing a bunch of chunks? Because Jesus is truly man. His flesh is not infinite. His flesh is fine, glorified, but finite. So you actually end up destroying the doctrine of the incarnation to believe this uh, uh, transubstantiation. Nonetheless, secondly, they believe that it has to be the real blood and it has to be the real flesh because otherwise, how would the Eucharist meal pay for your sin? Now, of course, I hope you realize why that is a moot point. And a ridiculous question. The supper doesn't pay for any sin. The supper celebrates that we don't have to pay for any sin. That's the whole point of the communion. But of course, they'll, they'll lean on the literal uh, translation, won't they? I wonder if you've had these debates and discussions. I wonder if you're here tonight and, and you believe this. That, well, it has to be literal. I mean, it, it has to be his real blood because he says that it is his blood. I say, whoa, 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 
Pause. Does Jesus say that this wine is my blood? I mean, if we're being literal, doesn't Jesus actually say, this cup is my blood? I've told many Catholics, start eating goblets. That is literally his blood. Oh, the wine in the middle doesn't change. No, 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 no. No, no, they got it all wrong. The cup is his blood. You might not find this as funny as I do. It's a real zinger. Okay, it's a real zinger, and we'll just keep moving on. Jesus, of course, saying that the, the signifying significance now, of course, the word signify for sign is in significance. Don't you see? The whole point, the significance of the sign, the, 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 the thing, the object to which the cup was pointing now is not a cup of thanksgiving for the exodus, which, which is what it represented in the Passover meal. It's no longer an Old Testament cup to celebrate Old Testament realities. It is now a new signifying significance and symbol. Jesus is saying, now when you drink the meal, and he only, he only recreated two portions, not all the meat, not all the herbs, not all the other things, but take the bread, body, and take the cup, and now what the cup represents is that a covenant has been ratified between God and man, and that covenant is sealed in my blood. Or in other words, in my death, in my life poured out in atonement for sin. So we, we can take three takeaway big picture points from what Jesus says here in these words. First of all, uh, three, uh, three things about the new covenant. Here's what we can learn about the new covenant. First of all, it is established or ratified, technical language. It's built on, basically. It's established in Jesus' death. A lot of religions will have ceremonies and, and uh, 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 anniversaries and things like that, remembering certain points of the life of their prophets or their teachers. Jesus did not institute a remembrance about the new covenant based on Christmas, did he? That's human invention, fine to do it. Jesus didn't institute Christmas. Jesus instituted a remembrance of his death. Human religious creators and leaders don't do that. They deny their death. They fear death. But Jesus made the new covenant. He, he pins the new covenant's effectiveness and power and the whole point of salvation and forgiveness. He made all of that about his death. That's what he did in doing this. My, my, he didn't just give the bread. He broke the bread and said, this is my body. In other words, he said, my body's broken. My body, just like this bread, is torn apart, broken, and given. It is, if you give your body up, that is language of being a martyr, of being, uh, being, being killed. Giving your life up is the language of giving your body. And so Jesus is hinting at death. When he talks about his life here, his, uh, his blood rather, he's also talking about his death. He's, he's re referencing Leviticus 17.11, which underpins this reality. God said in the Old Testament about the blood sacrificial system, he says, the life of animals is in the blood. And I have given that to you for you to make an atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by its life. When blood, because blood represents life when it's inside of you, blood also represents death when it's outside of you. So when Jesus says, my blood is poured out for you, he is obviously saying, my life will be given up, and this is all about my death. By Jesus separating his conceptual symbol body and his symbol of blood, he is echoing what would happen to the Old Testament sacrifices in their death. There will be bled and their blood taken here to the altar and their body taken over here to be eaten. Jesus, therefore, tells us that the first and most important thing about the new covenant is that it is established in Christ's death. The second thing to understand about the new covenant is that it brings about the forgiveness of sins. By the sacrifice of the new covenant, Jesus ultimately, wholly, fully, and truly brings about the forgiveness of everybody who is in that covenant. Let me say that again. By Jesus saying that my blood is poured out it is the new covenant poured out for the forgiveness of sins. That means Jesus is telling us that the sins of everybody in the covenant 
are infallibly, truly forgiven. Jesus is bringing something. I, I think, again, we're suffering of uh, uh, the chronological comparative ignorance. In other words, I don't think we get how amazing that would have sounded to an Israelite. When he said, this is for, this is what he doesn't say, the atonement of your souls on the altar until you sin again. He doesn't say, which the Old Testament, the whole Old Testament was, was really the on, only thing he was able to do. Hebrews tells us this. Jesus doesn't say, my blood poured out for you in the new covenant for the purification of your flesh for a time. He doesn't say that. He says, my blood is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. The actual, absolute clearing of debts Complete forgiveness of anybody who is in the new covenant. My blood is poured out, that's death, for the forgiveness of sins. That's the effect of the sacrifice. And here's the third thing to realize. If the new covenant is based in Jesus' death, if it affects and gives actual forgiveness of sins for all of its members and all of the people of God in the new covenant, then here's the third thing to realize. It is thereby a newer and much better covenant than the old. It is a glorious covenant, even when compared with the glory of the old covenant. That is why Jesus is putting away these old forms of ceremonies and shadows to make way for the much better covenant. Nowhere in the old covenant could you say that the sacrifice of this animal has washed away your sins and you're going to enjoy eternity in heaven with God because of the death of the lamb or the bull or the goat or the dove. Never. But in Jesus' blood, he can promise forgiveness of sins, and it is therefore much, much, much better. Compare Jesus' statement about his blood being poured out and the new covenant in his blood. Compare that with what Moses said. Because you remember after they made covenant with God and they established it in in, uh, in, in the Passover, they, they entered into uh, following Yahweh. They escaped Egypt. They're now Israelites are, are following and worshiping the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They, they had secured themselves to him. And they made that, that covenant with God at Sinai. And in Exodus chapter 24, verse 8, Moses took blood from the sacrifice and he threw it on the people. He gushed it all over the people, that it was sprinkled upon everybody present. And he said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Jesus says, behold, the blood of the covenant that God has made with you in accordance with all these words. But the words that Jesus spoke about the new covenant blood are infinitely better than the words spoken by Moses about the old covenant blood. The old covenant promised and God gave as a faithful God to the descendants of Abraham. He gave land, which it promised. He gave descendants and numbers, uh, uh, numerical descendants for Israel. He gave national protection. He gave a way of worshiping God that only they knew about because it was a revealed ceremony from heaven. And he promised them that they would be the family line of the Messiah who would one day come. What's missing? What's missing from all of these privileges? The forgiveness of sins. That was not able to be procured by old covenant blood. That was not a part of being Abraham's family according to the flesh. No one knows this blessing except for those who have faith in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. That is why Jeremiah prophesies the newer and better covenant. In Jeremiah 31, he prophesies the newer and better covenant that God was going to make with Israel. What the New New Testament shows us is that along with the remnant of Israel, a whole bunch of Gentiles welcome you uncircumcised Philistines. You and I welcomed into the city of, of heaven. Though we're not Israelites, we're spiritual sons of Israel by faith in Jesus Christ. But Jeremiah looked forward to that day of the gospel and he said, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'm going to make a new covenant with the house of Israel and Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day that I took them out of Egypt. My covenant, which they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. 
For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them, and I will write it on their hearts. I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer will you have to teach each one his neighbor, saying, Know the Lord. In other words, no longer will you have to speak to people in the covenant and say, You should really get saved. Do you, do you know our Lord and Savior, Yahweh? You don't say that to people in the covenant. Because they shall all know me, for I will forgive their sins and their iniquity, and I will remember their sins no more. There's no way of being in the new covenant and not being saved. There's no way that you can be in the covenant, the new covenant of Jesus, and not have your sins forgiven. There's no way you can be in the new covenant and not know that God is your God and not have his spirit writing the laws on your heart. There's no way. If you think there is, if you think that that's you, that, that, that you're in, but you're not going to heaven, that you're in, but your sins aren't forgiven, that you know, you're a Christian, but you still live in sin, the simple fact is you're not in the new covenant. That brings us to our final point of tonight. The new covenant is established in Christ's death. The new covenant promises forgiveness of sins. The new covenant is gloriously more ultimate and it is better than the old covenant and everything else God had ever spoken in the past. And lastly, the new covenant is entered by personal, volitional choice or belief. I don't mean choice or belief as two options. I mean, you have to make the choice, volitional, meaning coming up out of your will. You have to actually intentionally, intellectually, on a soul level, on a heart level, choose to receive Christ as your Lord, choose to, to call on the name of the Lord to receive his blessings. You have to do that for yourself because watching the new covenant take place, if you were there on Calvary, doesn't get you in. If you were one of the Roman soldiers who literally was sprinkled with the blood of Jesus, doesn't get you into heaven. If you were there sitting at the Passover meal with Jesus and you took some of the blood, uh, wine and took some of the, the bread and heard everything Jesus said, you're still not in the new covenant because even Judas was likely there that night. What gets you in is by calling on Jesus and saying, please save me. What gets you into the new covenant, having forgiveness of sins through his death, by his body and his blood forever, is by trusting him. So my question is not what you've done, whether you've been religious enough, whether you know the memorization of scriptures, whether you've made sure you haven't slept with too many people, you at least haven't had an abortion, you're at church at least more times a year than you're not. None of those questions have anything to do with the new covenant. The only question of the new covenant is this. Have you lent on, trusted in, and called on Jesus to be your savior? If you have, you have eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. If you have not, do it now as we pray. Father God, we thank you for your mercy. Greater mercy and greater grace than we could ever remember, imagine, think up. Greater mercy and grace in Jesus Christ than was ever shown to those saints of the Old Testament. Greater mercy and greater grace than Moses or any of the prophets could ever have imagined has been revealed clearly and explicitly to us in the age of the new covenant in the writings of the new covenant, in the apostles entrusted with the message of your new covenant. Lord God, in the gospel, there is mercy and grace beyond our wildest imaginations. And there is mercy and grace that is sufficient for the worst of sinners so that nobody has any excuse, nobody has any reason, nobody has any cause to fear, to think to themselves, I'm just too sinful because there your blood meets them there your grace surrounds them. There your mercy overwhelms them and tells them the blood of Jesus is poured out for the forgiveness of sins. We pray, Lord God, that this would be sealed to our hearts to glorify in you. We pray that those who have not yet believed would right now understand, understand the lengths to which you have gone to save souls, the, the grace which you have poured out in Jesus Christ, and they would simply bend their knees repent of their sin, trust in Christ, and be assured of salvation in this very moment. We pray this, Lord God, in your holy son's name. And everyone said,